We are ahead of the curve, devoted to Christ, a voice for the voiceless, accurate in preferring solutions to difficult problems. We are non-conformists, defining culture, compassionate towards humanity and the earth. We are also extraordinary high flyers who are reframing the world we live in. High life, we advance. Amen. Well, you're all very welcome uh, to a service this morning. Um, if you've been following us for a while, you know we've been uh, speaking. Uh, we've been doing a family series, and we sort of finished last Sunday, but sort of, yes, sort of. Because like I said, you know, as we pray, the Lord might have us talk about a few more things, and I think that's the case so I'm going to continue today, and we may do for a couple more weeks. Um, I, I want to say, though, that all through the series, uh, we did indicate that if you have any questions, um, you should put the questions in our question box, which is at the information desk at the entrance. We didn't receive any questions, so it must mean that either you didn't understand anything I said or everything was so clear that, you know, you had no questions. But please, if you have questions, um, please put the questions, write the questions down on any kind of sheet of paper and have them put in, the, um, in that box uh, or put them in the box on your way out. If we have enough questions, then I'll, we'll dedicate next Sunday to being a question and answer day. Uh, but if we don't have enough questions, then we will sort of do something else, okay? Um, so please, let's take advantage of that. Well, how many of us are ready for the word this morning? I am. Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful. Um, you are holy. You are separate. You are high and lifted up, and you are our Father. Holy Father, we, you deserve it all. We worship you this morning. Uh, and Lord, it's such a privilege that uh, a created being can get up and come into your very presence um, and commune with the King and with the Lord. And Lord, we come in today boldly because you have given us access. We come by the blood that speaks concerning our redemption and sanctification. We come by the cross uh, at which place we have laid everything that is about ourselves. We come, O oh God, by faith this morning. Um, we ask for the Spirit of God to come today. Um, we ask that every eye will be open, every ear will be unstopped. We ask that we will truly eat of the bread of life today. That we will truly drink water that will quench our thirst. Let transformation be the result of this time of ministry. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. I've titled the message this morning, uh, Maintaining a Tender Heart. Maintaining a Tender Heart. I'd like us to open our Bibles uh, to the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verse 1. We're going to start off this morning where we left off last week. Last week. I talked about the painful and difficult process of divorce and remarriage. And um, if you weren't here, um, I would advise that you download the message from the website. Uh, or you can get it on MP3 for a minimal fee at our desk, at our sounding desk. So this would be considered a part two to that message. Um, but don't worry if you didn't hear that message, you can understand this on its own. In Matthew 19, uh, verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished saying these things, that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Say to your neighbor, just any reason. 
And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one, one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Then they said to him, why, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? And he said, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart. Say to your neighbor, the hardness of heart. He said, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Say to your neighbor, at the beginning, it was not so. You see, what we examined last week, and I wouldn't do much of a summary because we have a lot of ground to cover today. So please get the message. But what we saw last week is that divorce is always the result of a heart being hardened in a relationship. As I was studying for this message this morning, I, I was looking at some verses and I saw there was a reference in my Bible or a comment in my study Bible and they made this comment. They said, in a fallen world with frail human beings, God allowed divorce to accommodate for broken humanity. But in the beginning, it was not so. Hallelujah. It was not so in the beginning. That was not God's plan for man. That was something that God did not want man to experience. But everyone that gets divorced, there is a hardness of heart that has come into that relationship. And what we also saw, that it is not the divorce itself that is the sin. It is the hardness of heart that comes into the relationship that is the sin. Now, there was a reference I made to the Lord, uh, and I promised I was going to give you the scriptural passage, but I didn't. Uh, so, let us turn to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3. Talking about maintaining a tender heart this morning. Jeremiah chapter 3. I'm going to start reading. I think I'll read the first eight verses. Uh, and I want to read all the verses so that um, you get the context of this. It says, they say, this is God speaking through Jeremiah. This, he said, they say that if a man divorces his wife... And she goes from him and become another man's. May he return to her again. We know from Deuteronomy 24 that he, he, the woman is not meant to go back to him. Will not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers. Yet return to me, says the Lord. Lift up your eyes to the desolate heights and see. Where have you not lain with men? He's speaking to Israel. By the road you have sat for them, like an Arabian in the wilderness, and you have polluted the land with your hallowed trees and your wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withheld, and there has been no latter rain. You have had a hallowed forehead. You refuse to be ashamed. Will you not from this time cry to me and say, My father, you are the guide of my youth. Will you remain angry forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, you have spoken and done evil, um, and done evil things as you were able. The Lord said to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, return to me. But she did not return. And her treacherous sister, now this is the Lord speaking. He says, her treacherous sister, Judah, saw it. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away 
and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister, Judah, did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. Uh, if you look at verse um, 14 of that same passage, the Lord says, Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. I will bring you to Zion. And if you study the history of Israel, you will see that God divorced the northern tribes of Israel. Uh, he stayed on with Judah, but he divorced the northern tribes of, of Israel uh, because of their infidelity. But you see that God was still in love with them. He was still in love with them, and he wanted them back. He said, I've sent you that bill of divorce, but I want you back. Come to me, but I'm not going to take you back on, any, on just any terms. You see, it's not necessarily the person that files for the divorce whose heart is hardened. In this particular story, we see that the Lord sent a bill of divorce, but his heart was soft towards his people. You know, if you have been beating your wife and she files for a divorce, it is you whose heart is hardened. It is you who has brought violence into your home. I have um, been privy to situations where this has happened. And in order to get some kind of legal protection and to get the law to force a man to do what he should do, the woman has to go to the courts and get protection from the courts through a divorce to enforce um, judgment to ensure that he does what he's supposed to do. I you know in the area of hypocrisy, I see a lot of hypocrisy also in this area because people are like, well, you know, uh, you know, let's, you know, she was the one that filed though. She was the one that filed. And everyone seems to think that the person that files is the person that is guilty. That is not necessarily the case. You know, in James 1.27, the Bible says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. The orphans and widows really touch the Lord's heart. Any church that is really in line with God's heart will pay particular attention to, the, to orphans and widows. But do you know the word often in the Greek is the Greek word orphanos, which really means somebody who has been abandoned. If you study it out, you see that the abandoned people didn't just lose their parents. The abandoned people were also people who had been abandoned by spouses, left without any other way of maintaining themselves. God has a soft spot in his heart for people who have been abandoned and he will take care of them. If you make an orphan out of your husband and abandon him and he divorces you, it is you whose heart is hardened. You have broken the covenant that you made before God to love and to cherish him. Amen. But we know that the solution to hard-heartedness is to be tender-hearted. Are you with me? Yeah? Because... A couple who remain tender-hearted to each other will never get divorced. Because divorce is always the result of the sin of hard-heartedness. So we're going to look today at how to maintain a tender heart to your wife, towards your wife, and towards your husband. Let us start from Ephesians chapter 3 verse 32. In Ephesians 3.32, the Bible says, And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So we have 
a commandment of God here that we should be kind and tender-hearted, soft-hearted towards one another. And I'm applying it specifically in the context of marriage. So it is possible to be tender-hearted towards your wife and towards your husband. You know, I couldn't improve on this reference again that I saw in my Bibles. I'm going to read this reference to you, this comment, this commentary. I thought it was very good. It says, every marriage involves two imperfect people. It not only is personally challenging to work out difficulties within a marriage, but it is also a spiritual contest. Since the adversary is always seeking points of vulnerability to work his destruction in our lives. So the challenge you may be having with a spouse is not just a physical challenge. The devil is looking, you know the Bible says that we have an adversary, he's, he's the devil, looking for whom he may devour. So he's trying to destroy that marriage because he knows that if he can destroy that marriage, he's going to affect that family. And if he can affect that family, he can affect destinies. And if he can affect destinies, the fabric of the nation and the purpose of God for your lives and for the nation will be impeded. So when we are going through challenges, there is a physical aspect, but there is also a spiritual aspect, which even makes it a lot more challenging. Because you can't just deal with it physically. You also need to understand that you have an adversary. And you need to use your weapons, your spiritual weapons of warfare. Let me go on with the commentary. It says a uh, temptation to self-interest and self-defense in our marriage relationship is a prime target. The enemy, our accuser, will point out. Everyone say point out. The enemy will point out and he will exaggerate. Everyone say exaggerate. He will point out and exaggerate your spouse's shortcomings and will foster anger and unforgiveness growing in our hearts toward one another. Jesus wants that Disintegration attacks the marriage where hardness of heart is allowed to grow. Wow. I think it's a great commentary. The devil is trying to exploit your vulnerabilities. He's trying to ex exaggerate your spouse's weaknesses while blinding your eyes to your own. Because what he wants to do is he wants anger to grow. He wants unforgiveness to grow because he knows that if anger can grow and unforgiveness can grow, it will cause your heart to become hardened. You know, your anger might be justified, but if you let it fester and you don't release it through quick forgiveness, your heart will become calloused. And your heart will change towards your spouse. You might still do what you are, what you normally do. But internally, you will be nursing a resentment against him or her. You know, hardness rarely happens suddenly. I've been married for 21 years. Hardness rarely happens suddenly, but it happens steadily over a long period of time with each unforgiveness. You know, I remember a time in my heart, I said, you know, I have, you know, I have, I will no longer allow this to happen in my family again. This was regarding a situation between myself and my wife, where over a period of time, I had let something fester, and instead of dealing with it, without saying anything, 
I'd come to a point where in my heart, I decided that, you know, I am going to be hard about this matter. I know I had to revisit that and get to the root of that and uproot that because I knew that it was setting me on a course that will permanently affect my relationship with my wife. And it's something, a temptation every single one of us is going to confront. You know, you might still act the same way. You might still smile. You might still be courteous. But on the inside, a callousness has come into your heart. And that's why it is important to forgive quickly. To forgive quickly. Hallelujah. To forgive quickly. You know, in Ephesians 4.26, I'm reading the New Living Translation. And I'm sure, by the way, she's also had that. <laughs> toward me. I'm just trying to, you know, equal opportunities, you know. Let not be said that he's the only one. You know, I'm sure, you know. In Ephesians 4.26, the New Living Translation, it says, And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold. A foothold to what? The devil. So he says be angry. You can be angry. You, you can, because a lot of times you may have justification for the anger. You can be angry, but don't let the anger control you. Don't let the sun deal with it quickly. Uproot it quickly. Because it is not the anger that gives the enemy foothold. It's the fact that you don't uproot it quickly. Because if you don't uproot it quickly... He will get a foothold. And you know, when the devil gets a foothold, you know, a foothold is almost like having a point of access into a home. Yeah? Now, when you have a point of access, it doesn't mean that because the point of access is small, the impact you can have will be small. Because point of access just means that the right of entry. Because once you can get in then you can destroy everything. Sometimes we underestimate the impact of a point of access. A point of access. And that's why Jesus could say that the prince of this world comes and he has no part in me. There is no point of access. I have closed every door, every window. There is no way, no place of vulnerability that he can use to get into my life. Don't wait until your spouse's heart becomes so hard that they are ready to go to a divorce court because then it may be too late. I'm not saying it is too late, but it may be. I have seen situations where one person has become so hardened and they didn't deal with it quickly enough. It's like, you know, somebody had stage one cancer, they didn't deal with it. And then they waited until we were stage four. Metastasized. Every organ has been, is now cancerous. And the doctors say, well, sorry. I mean, when we started stage one, we could have dealt with it. But now, go home and enjoy the rest of your days. But we know we, know we have a God who is a consuming fire. We know there's nothing you cannot turn around. If anyone would stop and say, you know what, God, I invite you into this situation. But what I'm saying is, the Lord wants us to prevent that from getting to that point. And the way we prevent it is by maintaining a tender heart. Maintaining a tender heart. Aim to keep your heart tender towards your spouse by forgiving quickly. And also by giving what each other needs to flourish. Maintain a tender heart by one, forgiving quickly. And then two, make sure you are giving your spouse what they need to flourish. 
You know, we've talked about the love languages earlier. The importance of loving your spouse in the way they like to be loved rather than the way you like to be loved yourself. Do you understand? Um, because the way you like to be loved is not necessary. We have different love languages. And it's important that if you're married, you are speaking to your spouse in the language they understand. So it's important to know your spouse's love language and give them what they need because when you are loving them, the way they like to be loved, it will cause them to flourish. We've talked about the five languages of love. I'm not going to go through it in detail because we've had a session on that. You can get the tape for that session. But the five love languages are kind actions, thoughtful presence, physical affection, loving words, and quality time. Kind actions, thoughtful presence, physical affection, loving words, and quality time. It is your responsibility to know what your spouse's love language is and speak to them in that language. It's your responsibility. It is easier for your spouse to forgive you when, you are be, when they feel that they are being loved by you in the way they like to be loved. Do you understand what I mean? It is easier. Help your spouse to forgive you easily. Do you understand what I'm saying? Help your spouse to forgive you what? Easily. Now we know um, that we must forgive irrespective of what people do. We know that the principle of forgiveness, you must forgive by faith. Uh, and to forgive by faith, you start by remembering the story or the parable of um, the unforgiving debtor. You know that parable in Matthew 18, from verse 21 to 35, where um, there was a king whose uh, servants had been borrowing money, and he wanted to settle accounts, and there was one particular debtor who owed a billion dollars. He owned a billion dollars, and this debtor, uh, he said, what, you own a billion dollars, you haven't paid, threw him in jail. And the debtor began to cry, forgive me, forgive me. Give me more time and I'll pay. So when you were free, you couldn't pay. But now that you're in jail, you are going to pay. And the, the, the master recognized that this person could never pay off the debt. So he released them of that debt. We are the ones that owed the father a billion dollars. We, every single one of us, owed the father a debt we could not pay. And because we could not pay the debt, he released us by forgiving us. Now, when you remember that, don't be like this unforgiving debtor who after it was released, somebody was owing him $20,000 and he said, you know, you, you did owe me the 20000 you didn't pay me the 20000 took him, threw him in jail. Now, that's called a wicked person. And the master punished that wicked person because given that he had been so forgiven, he could not release somebody that forgave, uh, that, that owed them less. Now, when we think about that, and we think about how much we have been forgiven, it gives us the faith to release somebody that has offended us, irrespective of how they act. Hallelujah. But you know, when God ordained marriage, he did not plan that that should be the only way. That is the, the, uh, the backup strategy. It is easier for your spouse to forgive you quickly if normally you are doing for them what they love. Now, we want to focus on that bit today because we're talking about maintaining what? A tender heart. Maintaining a tender heart. When they are feeling cared for by you. When you are loving them in the way they love to be loved. When you err and offend them. They will let go of it quickly. Because they want to go back to how things were. Are you, are you tracking with me? And being cared for means that our deepest emotional needs are being met by our spouse. That's what being cared for means. It means that 
you are giving them or you are meeting their deepest what? Their deepest needs, their deepest emotional needs. You know, marriage is a special relationship. Because in marriage, you are making a commitment to allow your spouse exclusive right to meet your deepest emotional needs. And if those needs are unmet, it is unfair to you. Because that means that you have to go through life with no ethical alternatives. Are you tracking with me here? Yeah? Because what you're doing when you get married is, you see, I am, I am taking you no other person. You are, we are exclusive now. All your deepest emotional needs, I will meet them. All my deepest emotional needs, you will meet them. Now, if we now get married, and, the, and that's why I had this session on, it is important to sit down and go through the terms. Because it's a covenant. Yeah, it's a covenant. We go through the terms. Because if we get in, and those deepest emotional needs are not being met, that means that you leave your spouse with no ethical alternative. They have to sit there and just... We are committed. You know, I watched the <laughs> I watched a, a short video by Bishop Jakes, you know, recently about commitment, you know, about commitment to marriage. Fantastic video. Lovely video. Commitment. Commitment. You're not dating, you're married. You're committed. And that's true, but that was not God's plan. I'm not saying it wasn't God's plan to be committed to your wife. I'm saying that the, God's plan for your marriage was much more than commitment. It is not staying together because we are committed. It is staying together because we love each other and we are serving each other's needs. That was God's original plan. That was God's original plan. It wasn't a commitment strategy. It was an intoxication strategy. Are you with me this morning? Being cared for. Meeting your spouse's Deepest emotional needs. Because if they are not met, they have no ethical alternatives. And unfortunately, because we don't focus on this, we have husbands and wives walking around like the walking wounded. We may smile at each other and are civil, but there's an uncomfortable air of unmet need that separates us. It's uncomfortable air. You can sense it. You can sense it. An uncomfortable air of unmet need. That's a, we have to deal with that. We have to deal with that. You know, studies have shown that the five most important needs that men have are these. And I'll give them in order of priority. Now, whenever you generalize something, you might be the exception to the rule. But I'm just saying generally. But the principle is, yes, you want to maintain a tender heart. And you maintain a tender heart by forgiving quickly. And also by meeting the person's deepest emotional needs. And you want your husband's heart to be tender toward you. Just like you want your wife's heart to be tender towards you. The husband. Why are you guys looking at me so seriously? Well, studies have shown... That the five most important needs that men have are these. In order of priority. Number one being the most important. Like I said, you might be the man that the exception to the rule. Number one is sexual fulfillment. Number two is recreational companionship. Someone they can hang out with. Number three is an attractive spouse. At least attractive to them. Number four is domestic support. That's help with the house. And number five is admiration. A woman that whenever he's around, she always makes him feel better about himself. Not someone that feels that it is their objective to, to give him a reality check. Because as men, we get reality checks all the time. 
We are not coming home to get a reality check. Those are the five most important. Let me repeat them. You see, there is a lot that is said about marriage. And sometimes you hear people talk about marriage and it's like they don't read the Bible. They don't read the Bible. They just talk commitments, submit, love. They're not reading the spirit of the word. Yeah? If I'm just meant to walk in love towards my wife like everyone else, then I can marry everybody. Is that not the case? Number one is sexual fulfillment. Number two, recreational companionship. Number three, an attractive spouse. Number four, domestic support. Number five, admiration. The five most important needs that women have. Again, you might be the exception to the rule. But generally, it is said that these are the five most important things that women need in order of priority. The first being the most what? Important. Number one is affection. Number two is conversation. Number three is honesty and openness. Number four is financial support where necessary. And number five is a family. I'll say that again. Number one is affection. Number two, conversation. Number three, honesty and openness. Number four, financial support where necessary. And number five, family. Now, it does not mean that women do not like want sexual fulfillment and men do not want, want affection. You understand what I mean? But in order of priority, when they sampled most men and when they sampled most women, these were the top ones or the, the, the most important for them. And of course, the way you will know what your husband's one is, is by asking him. But even if you don't ask him, you know, these are what most men or most women fall into. So if you want to help your husband forgive you quickly, you need to have sex with him often. If you want to help him forgive you quickly. You know, this is for people who want help. If you want to help your husband to forgive you quickly, you need to have sex with him often. If you want to help your wife to forgive you quickly, you need to be very affectionate toward her the way she likes to be loved. Women, if sex is not a big priority for you, understand that it is a big priority for him. And for the man, if this emotional stuff is not a priority for you, understand that it is a big priority for her and you both swore to God to love and to cherish each other this is what love and cherishing each other looks like that's what it looks like if you don't make what is a priority to your spouse your priority you are hardening your heart toward them and you are dealing treacherously with them. It is amazing that God looks at things very differently from how we look at them. If the priority that your spouse has is not a priority for you, then what you are doing is you are hardening your heart toward your spouse. And you are dealing treacherously with them. That is God's perspective. You know, Ecclesiastes 9 by verse 9 says we should live joyfully. Joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life. Which he has given you under the sun. All the days of your vanity for that is your portion in life and in your labor which you perform under the sun. You know, to an unbeliever, the only joy that they can hope to have in life is that which comes from a good marriage. Are you with me? Yeah? You want to rejoice with the wife of your youth. In life, they are not 
that many things. Thank God for the presence of God. But your marriage in life is one of the great joys. One of the great joys that God has ordained for you as a human being. So the, your joy in marriage is important. It's important. It's important. It's important to God. Hallelujah. So let us look today, just very briefly, at the number one priority for men and the number one priority for women. Let us look at those because we're talking about what? Being tender. We want to maintain a tender heart towards each other. Hallelujah. Let everyone that has an ear to hear, let them hear. Look at Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs 5, I'm going to read from verses 15 to 18. Okay, it says, drink water from your own cistern and run in water from your own well. Till your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. Let, the, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. And then it tells us how. Verse 19 says, As a loving deer and a grateful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. Uh-huh. I'm going to break that down this morning. Now, it says that you should be satisfied with your own. Yeah? And there's something in the beautiful imagery that Solomon in his wisdom paints here. Because he's speaking about the wife as a cistern or a well. A well is a deep reservoir of water. Are you with me? There is water in the, in the well. But he says that the wife is like a well. But he says, um, be satisfied with your, drink water from your own cistern. And running water from your own well. Don't let your own fountain. Now you have what? The man has what? A, a fountain. What is the difference between a fountain and a well? They, have, they both have water, right? But a well, the water is, is still. In a fountain... There is pressure. There is pressure. Abibiola. There is pressure. There is pressure. Now, as a well, you may not understand the pressure. What, what is the problem with you? No, it's not a problem. He is a fountain. God made him that way. Are you with me? It says, be satisfied. He says to the fountain, be satisfied with your well. Don't take your fountain everywhere because... We don't want running water along the streets. We don't want you to see a child somewhere and think, ah, well, that child looks like, um. <laughs> ah, this child, you, this child, well, why does he look so much like this guy? Solomon says, don't let your streams be all over the place. Are you with me? Be satisfied with your own. But then he tells us what satisfaction looks like. Yeah? It says, as a loving deer, and what a grateful doe, let allow her breast to satisfy you at all times, and always be enraptured with her love. That word, enraptured with her love, the New Living Translation says, always be captivated with her love. The NIV says, always be intoxicated. Now, has anyone ever gotten drunk here before? Always been intoxicated. You know, when somebody's intoxicated, yeah, when somebody's intoxicated, they have received something that has changed their ability to walk straight. It is not a little sip. It changes your ability. It has, in fact, there is nothing you can do that will not remind you of what you have ingested. 
And what you are looking forward to is your next drink. Now, he's saying that a wife is meant to be the source of intoxication for her husband. Hallelujah. So, this verse assumes that the wife makes her breasts available. It says, let, in fact... It says, let her breasts satisfy you when? Always. Sorry. There's an implicit assumption in that passage that the woman understands that this guy needs to be intoxicated with everything that you have. What you have is enough, but you just need to make it available more often. And understand that he's a fountain. So he might want it a little bit more than you feel might be necessary for you. But it is not about you in, on this occasion. Mm-hmm. Look at 1 Corinthians 7. Or one, uh, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 1. Let's just read this from the New Living Translation. Now it says I have five more minutes. But... I need to talk about the women as well. So, would you allow me some more time? Because right now, I'm just talking about the guys and, you know, they said it's five minutes to go. Yeah? So, would you allow me a little bit more time to talk about the women's side? I only want the women to answer to this one. (laughs) First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. We'll do this quickly. And I'll read straight from the New Living Translation. It says, now, regarding the questions you asked in your letter, yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations, but because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman should have her own husband. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs, and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so that you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of what? Because of your lack of self-control. Your husband should not be leaving home sexually unfulfilled. You are as responsible for your husband's sexual purity as he is for yours. I'll say that again. Your husband should not be leaving home sexually unfulfilled. You are as responsible for your husband's sexual purity as he is for your sexual purity. As far as the Lord is concerned, Sexual intimacy is not the icing on the cake in marriage. It is an intricate part of the cake itself. Hebrews 13 verse 4 says, Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Meaning, if you leave your marriage to go and fornicate and become an adulterer, the Lord will judge you because he ordains that in that marriage all your sexual desires are fulfilled. If you are preventing your spouse's sexual desires from being fulfilled in your marriage, you are exposing them to the enemy. And if they fall, it is their responsibility, but God is going to hold you responsible as well. You can mark my words. It is the truth. Because you made a commitment before Almighty God. He will hold you responsible as well. You don't need to experience, you don't need to be experienced sexually before marriage in order for you to have a fulfilling sexual relationship. In in, in actual fact, prior experience can be a hindrance because you assume to understand what it takes. Uh, What you need is to express your desires freely to one another and to learn to give each other pleasure as the person likes it. I will make a caveat here. Do not allow your sexual desires to become sexual lusts. We live in a fallen world and sometimes because of the 
inputs that we are getting from the world system, Satan is fueling our desires. You need to take, if a sexual desire you have, even as a married person, is a loss and is fueled by the devil, you need to take that lust to the cross and let the Lord deliver you. As a man, you must not watch pornography. You must not watch pornography with your wife because you think, well, let us learn how it is done. Yeah? Um, or because you feel that pornography excites you. You must not do that. Because if you do that, every time you watch pornography, you are opening the door to the demonic into your home. You must not indulge in practices for which God de destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. That's called sexual perversion. If you are feeling that way, you need to take that feeling to the cross. You must not do things that bring pain to your spouse. Where you get satisfaction at their own expense. Yeah, that is not what sexual, healthy sexual desire is all about. But outside the bounds of perversion, your desires are meant to be fulfilled by your spouse in marriage. Amen. And as a husband and as a wife, you must do whatever it takes, whatever it takes, to ensure that that is done. It might need you to adjust your schedule. But you know, we adjust our schedules for things that are important. Yeah? There's no excuse. If you want to follow God and obey him, and if you want to have a tender heart, and if you want your husband's heart to be tender, you must do this. And it's not just men that like sex. Men, women like it too. So if you want your wife's heart to be tender, you must do this too. If it's a priority for her. But then, let's talk about the thing that is important to most women. Affection. You can't say I'm not, emo I'm not the emotional type. Then why did you marry her? Why did you marry her? You went before God and you stood and said, I would love and cherish. I am not the emotional type. should mean... That I am going to learn to be emotional because in order to meet her deepest felt need, you must give her affection the way she likes to receive affection. Yeah? And it must become a priority for you. It must become a priority for you. You know, the concept of a date night is something that we must all get involved in. Where we switch up the phone and we take our wives out and do whatever she wants to do, and be there, present, mentally, spiritually, physically. It might feel like a sacrifice, but you are speaking in her language. And if you want her to be able to forgive you quickly, you need to do that. Lagos life may make it impossible for you to do it weekly, but at least let us start with twice a month. And increase it. There are many marriages that don't have any kind of date night for months. Even years. Just come in. on my food. And then. I'm watching. I'm watching. Tele, I'm watching. You know. Football. And, and then. You know. And then once you get into bed. It's time to sleep. Where's the wife? Yeah. You are, you are hardening your heart towards your spouse. You are hardening your heart towards your spouse. Send her a text. Often. Giving her a compliment. That's affection. From work, just send her a text. You know, Mark Twain said, I can live for two months on a good compliment. Send her a text that she's not expecting. Tell her you love her and do it not just after you've had sex. Tell her you love her. Looking at married couples here. Yeah. We're talking about maintaining what? A tender heart. When your heart, the heart of your spouse is tender towards you. When you err, they will forgive you quickly. They'll be, they're encouraged to forgive you quickly. One of the other ways I thought about to maintain a tender heart is go through your wedding album. You know when you first got married, your wedding album. And your first few years together, the pictures you took when you just started having, having children. What will happen when you do that is that the way you used to feel about each other 
will come up again in your heart. Yeah? Go down memory lane. And as those emotions come up, build on those emotions. We're talking about a tender heart. We're not just talking about staying together. And what I've found is that the devil uses certain areas of vulnerability to tempt the sexes. There are certain sins that men are more vulnerable to. And they are more vulnerable to those sins, not because they are unrighteous, whatever, what, un, what am I hearing? Unrighteous perverts. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Do you want to own up to saying that in your heart? Because the Lord speaks to me, you know. Yes. Not because they are dogs. Ah! <laughs> who, who, is, who did we invite into this church this morning? <laughs> Yeah? There are certain sins that men are more vulnerable to. And there are certain sins that women are more vulnerable to. And if we protect our husbands, the devil will not be able to exploit that. Now, one of the most vulnerable things that men uh, are exposed to is sex. is illicit sex, fornication, adultery. It's a vulnerability. And as a man, you need to guard against that. As a woman, you can help him. Yeah? In Proverbs 5 that we're reading, in verse 20, to 22, he says, why be captivated, my son, by an immoral woman, or fondle the breasts of a promiscuous woman? For the Lord sees clearly what a man does, examining every path he takes. An evil man is held captive by his own sins. There are ropes that catch and hold him. Yeah? Um, he, the Bible says a lot about that, particularly for men, because it's an area of vulnerability. Men, we need to guard against that. Everyone is vulnerable. Yeah, we need to guard against that. Women, wives, you can help them. You can help us. Not them, but us. Okay? Another area that men are very vulnerable to, and this is why the Bible says, husbands love your wives. It's about affection, sacrificial love, in the way they like, they like to be loved. I don't like shopping. I don't, I don't like, I don't even shop for myself. Yeah? That might come to you as a strange thing, but I don't like shopping. But my, my, my wife loves. She hasn't had opportunity to do a lot of that recently, but she loves shopping. So every time we go, have to go shopping together, like I said, have to go shopping together. Every time we go shopping together, you know, I'm basically tracking her. We're just tailing her. And, you know, I was like, okay, how long do you want to, okay, let's just go on. And in my mind, I always think that, you know, at least after three hours, it should be okay, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh and it's not like she's she's buying stuff for the, she's, she has to look through all the shops first and then compare the prices across all the shops <laughs> God help you if you're in America and you're in all these big malls you know so you feel like you're dying you're being resurrected and you're dying again I'm being resurrected that's the feeling. Yeah. That's the feeling. So when the Bible says husbands love your wives, it's because they know that that's an area of vulnerability. And the devil is going to try to exploit that. Loving her the way she likes to be loved. Women, areas of vulnerability of women, and this is, can be traced back to Eve. You know, when Eve fell, Eve was deceived. And she was actually deceived rather easily. Eve was convinced that God was holding something from her. Even the magnificence of Eden did not convince her that God's heart was good. Eve was deceived. And as a result, the openness and vulnerability reflected in the nature of Eve took a dive into the region of control. Eve has sworn that I will not be deceived ever again. So every daughter of Eve wants to control her surroundings. They want to control her relationships. She wants to control her husband. She wants to control her God. A vulnerability of women is control. Yeah? And that's why the Bible says, submit to your husband. That of your own volition, 
Hand over that control to him. That is the place of your greatest strength. It is a place of vulnerability for women. They want to control everything. Yeah? That's something you need to be careful of. Control. A lot of women will use sex to control. Yeah? So I can, okay, I know he likes this, so I can use this tool. If I want him to do something, I will withdraw. And then when he really wants it, I'll say, oh, but babes, I want you to do this thing for me. Yeah. And then he submits. And then I give him a little bit. I use sex to control. Women do that. It's an air of vulnerability. You need to stop that. It is wicked. It is of the devil. If you want a reference, look at Proverbs 4, 23 to 29. And he speaks about this kind of woman as an evil woman. It's evil. It's an air of vulnerability that women have. The last air of vulnerability I'll look at that women have is words. Words. I might not be able to beat him, but I can speak. Words. It's something that as a wife, you need to be careful of. Proverbs 19.13 says, The nagging of a wife is an endless drinking. The quarreling of a wife is as a constant dripping of water. That's Proverbs 19.13. The quarreling of a wife is as a constant dripping of water. Proverbs 21 verse 9 and verse 19. Verse 9 says, It is better to live in the corner of an attic than with a crabby woman in a lovely house. Yes. <laughs> it is better to live in the corner of an attic. That's, you know what, this big house. Let me go to this small place. <laughs> yeah. Because a woman who does not submit her tongue to the Lord will use that tongue to drive her husband away. It will stay away rather than listen to your nagging. It would rather stay in the office, travel every day, sleep in the car, than be in your lovely house if you are a nag. That's an area that as a woman, it's an area of vulnerability that the enemy is going to use um, to uh, seduce you. Lastly, James 3 verse 6 says, among all the parts of the body, this is the New Living Translation, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. Yeah, hell is, when, when that anger rises, and you say, okay, I cannot beat him, and then you frame a construction of words understand that the foundation of that construction is hell itself because those words are spiritual in their impact and when you unleash them they are aimed to frame his life and frame his future the bible says that we should be kind towards one another we should be tender hearted Forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven us. We do it by forgiving quickly. We do it by loving each other the way they like to be loved. That way our hearts are always tender toward each other. Yeah? And then God can do in our lives what he aims to do. And, and we'll never be in a place where we are contemplating divorce because we'll never allow hardness to come into our hearts. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. You get something from the message this morning. Praise the Lord Jesus. God is good, isn't he? High Life. We advance.